Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? How's everybody doing this morning? Good. My name is Nick. This is Lauren. This is Anna and the team. Would you stand with us in worship this morning? Um, church, the God's word says in Psalm 118 that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do you believe that this morning? I want to just take a minute um, to just thank God for what he's done, how, how faithful he has been to you this week. Um, if you want to just bow your head and just give him the praise this morning, and then we'll open in worship.
Sing it again. Sing words. in the highest place, sing worthy. Soften our hearts today, God. Get rid of any distractions. We praise you. We thank you in your mighty name. Amen. You can stay standing. Pray with me. God, thank you that you are Adonai, Lord Master, our perfect leader. Elohim, creator of all things. El Shaddai, God Almighty, Emmanuel, God with us. Help us to trust you in all things. Let's pray that quietly to ourselves. pray this second prompt together. God, please help us to honor the people around us, our family members, our co-workers, our neighbors. Give us the mind of Christ who humbled himself for us. Let's pray through this third one. God, please meet us in this place today and speak to our hearts. We belong to you. We desire to hear from you. you do two things for me if there are seats in the middle would you please scoot in and would you greet those around you and then have a seat, and then have a seat. <laughs> don't stay standing Mark and LaVon Johnston started a group that um, could get together, just praying for Albania. Mark introduced us to Pastor Eddie, and when Eddie decided to start the online English program, we were right on board with that. Always I, I wanted to learn English, and when my husband showed it to me an advertisement, uh, I thought, oh, this is a good opportunity for me because uh, the English course Emmanuel Church offered for Albanians were uh, for free. Towards the end of our time with the course, Sylvia um, said that she was very interested in continuing 
um, and just reading the Bible with me. I knew some information about Jesus as a history teacher and uh, as a Muslim uh, background. I knew another fact that uh, Jesus for them was a prophet of God, uh, but not the son of God the Father. We finished the course and we continued to meet every week. And I started in with the, with the Gospels and we just went through and read through the Gospels. And then I would always be talking to her about the importance of who Jesus is and the, the necessity to make a choice um, for who he is in her life. And at one point that occurred. And she said, yep, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus uh, is um, always with me. And uh, I have felt his presence from the beginning when I accepted him and I uh, was a follower uh, of him uh, because uh, he, he changed uh, a lot of things in my lives. He changed my thoughts, he changed my desires. And uh, from then and on, he has, uh, I, I knew that uh, he has been there, is and will be with me forever. Geraldine uh, uh, is a good friend, uh, not only a teacher for me, but uh, I found a good friend on her. I found a sister, I found a colleague that uh, we use uh, to share a lot of things from our lives from then and now. The Great Commission is this, this um, way of partnering with God in telling what Jesus has done to bring us back into a connection with God the Father that we don't have without Jesus. And I really love this section of Isaiah 43 that talks where God is speaking and he is saying, Bring my sons from afar, from afar and, and my, my daughters, daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom, whom I, I have formed, formed, even whom I have made. And I love that. God says, bring them, bring them to me. Because it is the Holy Spirit who does the work. But we have this, this glorious privilege of, of being a partner with God in just being able to, just to be with people, communicate his love to people. And to me, this is all about the glory of God. Well, good morning. <clears throat> maybe, maybe the Lord will return this year. Who knows? Um, it would be amazing if he were to return for his people to be active in sharing their faith with others. And I just wanted to highlight this one um, scenario here with Mike and Gerilyn. They're actually here today. So if you have questions for them, this is a fantastic opportunity um, to, to just consider tutoring someone in English who doesn't even live in the U.S. So here you have a c country that's primary Muslim and um, the opportunity to teach English. And then through that, you can share the gospel with them. Um, we have an online opportunity on our website for you to sign up for this, and then by October the 4th, um, it would be our deadline for that. But we, um, Eddie in um, Albania is still looking for about 15 people to be tutoring, so they put these ads out in Albania, and then people can learn English, and it would be fantastic if uh, some of you here this morning would uh, be willing to take um, time out of your, once a week out of your schedule to, be, to uh, be tutoring someone online. So just pray about that and think about that. Um, you, can, you can get more information on our website uh, for that and be able to do that. Um, if you're just visiting today, we wanna welcome you. My name is Bobby and we're glad that you're here today. Um, we, we have a connection card in, in the seat pocket in front of you. You're welcome to grab that. Um, you can also scan the QR code. We have, a, we have a gift for you downstairs at the welcome desk. And we'd love to know that you're here today and how we can pray for you. And we're, just, we're glad that you're spending some time with us. Um, In-house, a few things. Um, for those of you who are parents, child dedications are coming up here in October. And we'd love for you to celebrate with us. We want to pray with you around your children as we dedicate them to the Lord, so you can sign up for that online. 
Um, the men's retreat is coming up here in October, and we'd love for you uh, guys to be able to get to know some other guys around a week and be encouraged around the faithfulness of God, so you can sign up for that. And then uh, prayer night, once a month, the second Thursday of each month, we want to uh, be praying, uh, going into a second site here as a church, and also with world events and politics um, and all the things happening around us, we just believe we need to be a praying church. And so we have uh, the second Thursday of each month, um, we'll meet and pray together. And we have child care that's provided for that. And so we'd love for you to be able to join us on that. All right, um, we're going to jump into our topic today. So let's just take a moment to pray quietly. Just ask the Lord to meet us for a moment here, and then we'll get into it. Lord, we just want to thank you for your word, and we just pray that you would meet us in this space, that you would um, open our hearts and just prepare us for what you have to say today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So my wife, Jen, is a nurse, and a couple years ago at work, someone asked her to, if she'd be willing to take on an extra shift next week, and she said, uh, let me check with Bobby, and then I'll get back to you. And the woman was aghast. She said, what? You have to ask for your husband's permission? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about how to honor each other. And specifically, some of these gender issues are addressed in chapter 11. Um, this is um, something that culture is pretty sensitive on. And we've, we've come a long way in culture around these things. And uh, we're, we're so far removed from some of the customs that happen in the Middle East, so I need to kind of reel it back a little bit to explain some of those things. Um, I, was, I was so convicted before the sermon, I actually went and had my hair cut because I'm like, man, I got to get this right. Um, I'm just kidding. I, actually, um, we're just going to kind of try to discern what is, what is um, behind the veil of some of these cultural things. What is God trying to unpack for us? And I really believe... The simple idea today is that, that um, it's important for us to honor each other, right? We want to be honoring. And so what does that look like today in our culture? So let's go to chapter 11, and we'll start in, in verse 2, where Paul is writing to these believers in the city of Corinth. I commend you. You remember me in everything and maintain the traditions as I've delivered them to you. His first words are a commendation. I, you guys have been honoring to me. I've, I've been uh, an apostle who founded the church. I've been asked by God to sort of lay the foundation for the church. You guys have um, been listening to the, the Greek word traditions is the teachings um, as delivered, and I commend you for that. And now Paul in verse 3 is going to dive into a question that he is answering around when they assemble together. It's not working out so well. It's kind of dishonoring towards each other when you, when you meet together. And so he's going to address some of that. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven." So in the context of this, in the Roman Empire, the, the local church was this beautiful um, change from what people had been experiencing. People had been very oppressed in the Roman Empire. And when it came to church, all of a sudden, they would be able to come and there was no division by socioeconomics, right? You could be very wealthy in the church and very poor and you're just as one. Um, you could come from all different races and you would be accepted as one. If, whether you're male or female, it didn't matter. You were, you were one. And so it was a beautiful thing. They were able to celebrate that. So they came together, and they're praying and prophesying in this, in this room. And all of a sudden, it started to feel uncomfortable culturally because some of the women had taken off their head coverings, and they were just freely praying and prophesying. And so they were kind of asking Paul, how do we address some of these things? It doesn't feel quite right um, in this context. 
So Paul actually starts out with the underlying principle of what, did, what does headship even mean in the Bible? And we'll talk about that. And then how do we interpret that into culture today? So verses, verse 3, actually, the idea of headship, you have the idea of God, Jesus, husband, wife, and you have this headship that's listed where we, we're trying to understand what does it actually mean? And when we understand the way Jesus honored the headship of his father, um, it helps us to understand the word headship and that it means authority, right? The authority. So the way Jesus operated is he would say, Father, not my will, but your will be done. That Jesus emptied himself willingly. It was his choice. And he became obedient to death, even on a cross. And then God highly exalted him and gave him the name that was above every name. So you see something around Jesus um, the way he would honor the headship of his father. And as he went along, he would be looking to the father to say, basically, God, may your will be done in this, right? And so then Paul brings in the example of a husband and wife. And um, it mirrors what he says in Ephesians chapter 5 about, um, about headship. And that the husband has to be the one who's, um, who's held responsible in the end. Um, the question of headship is really the question, when it comes down to it, who's really in charge or who has to give a final account for what's happening here? And so that's, in order to avoid chaos or total anarchy, um, there has to be some sort of a line of authority, right? So it's not a question of who's better or, for wor or worse, because we know that when Jesus was questioned, it was I and my father are one. We know within marriage that there's oneness. So we know that the Bible actually teaches headship and partnership. They're, they both are linked together. But again, in order to avoid chaos, there's always got to be a line of authority. In other words, everybody's under some sort of authority. I'm under the authority of the elder board here at CFC. The elder board's under the authority of our district superintendent in Harrisburg. Uh, and, um, he's under the authority of our president um, in, in Columbus, Ohio, of, of our denomination and so on. So people are under... Um, different levels of authority. There's a line of authority. But I think it's interesting that he doesn't just remind us of authority in here, but then in verse 11, he says, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman, for as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. It's like, don't forget your mother, guys. <laughs> I gave birth to you. So we not only have the teaching of headship in the Bible, but then um, it is elaborated and linked together with this idea of partnership that husband and wife are really interdependent. Um, it's, it's, it's funny to me that Adam in the garden, when God had created him, he gets to have this perfect world in the garden. And he also gets to enjoy walking with God in the garden, like direct access to God. And God looks at Adam and says, dude, you are, you are incomplete. <laughs> like even in the perfect world with direct access to God, you're still not finished. And so he completes him by creating Eve. And then he gives this imagery that they're actually in a partnership. So they're really one. They're, they're one together. Um, for, for Jen and I, um, the way this, this will work is we like to be together on our decisions. And we like to like give clarity. You decide in this area, you in this area. And then when we're working things out together, we like to be on the same page. And that's basically the way we've operated. I think there was once when we were trying to decide on buying a car where she just was like, not sure. And she's like, just, you just decide, right? But we like to be on the same page. Um, in, again, in order to avoid anarchy or chaos, somebody has to make a final decision. And so that's how, how God has designed it here. I just want to talk briefly about this phrase, the head, um, the, the head of, of a wife is her husband. In Genesis 2, then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So that word shamar in the Hebrew is to guard it or to protect it or to watch over it, right? And so just imagine when Eve was in the garden and all of a sudden the serpent comes. When the garden was faced with a threat, Adam did nothing, when Eve was under spiritual attack, Adam did nothing. When Eve was offered fruit, Adam took the path of least resistance. When God came to speak to him, he hid. And when God confronted him, he blamed Eve. So Eve actually took of the fruit and ate it. 
And then she gave it to Adam, and then he ate it. And who is held responsible for the fall? It's Adam. He's the one who's held responsible for the fall of mankind. Um, In Genesis 3, um, one of the results of the curse is to Eve, it is your desire will be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. Have any of you had an easy marriage? So built into marriage and into the curse is this idea that um, we're going to struggle along the way. Adam was passive, and he, um, he passed that down to, to other men. So we as men can tend to be passive. So here's Eve, and she has to um, live with a loser. How does that feel, ladies? <laughs> you have to live with a, a passive loser. That's, that's the default so that's why the Bible says to respect your husband and do, to do it as unto God, to do it as unto God, because it's pretty hard to be respectful sometimes of someone who has inherited these tendencies from Adam, right? And so that's just um, part of, part of the, the story in, in here is the, the fall. And um, the only one who really redeems this is Jesus on the cross. When you imagine what Jesus did on the cross, paying the biggest sacrifice as the encourager and to present her complete. And the bride, the church of Christ, in nonstop honor, willing to follow Jesus and pleased to do that. So it's Jesus on the cross that redeems this imagery. And that's why the world and our culture cannot fathom the idea of the role of husband and wife in the Bible because they don't, understand, they don't know Christ. They don't know what Jesus has done and how Jesus when it works properly, will transform men into being able to be active as Christ, um, sacrificial to guard and protect, and to emulate um, the, the sacrificial love of Christ on the cross. So when we know Jesus, it will help to redeem um, God's design. So, so Paul in, in verse 3 kind of lays out the, um, the design or the... the, the um, the biblical background of headship and um, of partnership. And then he goes into more of the cultural context of what it looks like to honor. So in verse 4, um, he's talking about men should, have, um, should not cover their heads. Ladies should cover their heads in this context. And then some of the reasoning is that um, it's disgraceful in that culture for a woman not to cover her head. Uh, for men, it, it, it can be associated with, um, with a lack of respect and even prostitution in that culture. Um, secondly, the man, um, he is the image and glory of God in verse 7. And so it's a glorious thing to see a strong man willing to um, be in submission to Jesus Christ. To, for, for someone, for a man, in his strength to bow before God and be in submission. And then it says that woman is the glory of man. And it's something powerful for the beauty of a woman to be willing to be respectful of the role of the husband and to submit to that. And um, then it says that woman in verse 8 and 9 was made from man and for man. So then in that culture, they have the head covering as a symbol of authority. And in some churches, they even take this literally and still ask uh, for for ladies to wear a head covering. We don't don't believe um, here at CFC that that is um, um, culturally where we're at today. And so... The fourth reason in this is just for the sake of the honor of angels. All right? So because of the angels. Now, what is that talking about? Because of the angels. So we have in this passage um, an interesting thought about the idea that angels were there in God's original design of creation. They were there um, when one-third of the angels fell. And, um, and, and went into a rebellion. And then um, angels are present in our public worship. Angels are here in the room as we worship. And uh, they're, they're, they're here when we pray. They're um, ministering agents for you. Um, angels are there to help us and to support us. And as they're observing, they love to see God's design fulfilled um, when it comes to honoring each other. So that's the idea of honor. And then verse 13 um, Paul just goes into this idea. You judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray um, to God with her head uncovered and so on? He asks people to judge in verse 16 not to be contentious. 
So I want to take a few minutes just to say let's discern or let's judge for ourselves and kind of unfocus and not get stuck on just the idea of head coverings because anybody can do things on the outward, right, and, and adjust to things on the outward. But what does it look like to actually honor each other um, today? So for a husband to take on the role of Christ, to be sacrificial in his love, um, and to be willing to take the high ground, to, to guard and protect the home, um, not to be easily offended, and to be willing to honor his, his wife and his family in that way. And then for a wife, what does it look like to be honoring and respectful of the role of a husband? Um, it can be easy as husband and wife just to s- separate out and say, well, you do you. You know, you do you. We'll each have our own bank account, our own budgets, our own time, and you just, you do you. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect God's design for partnership in marriage and um, to be able to be honoring with each other. I know for, for Jen and I, um, our personality differences, uh, Jen's a very strong personality, a God-given um, strength that she has, and uh, an Italian from Long Island. And so when, when Jen and I were married, I was like, man, how, how am I going to be able to lead her? And my default, like Adam, was like, you just lead the way. You just, you, you do you kind of thing. And um, realize that that's not really God's design. So we've had to work together to be able to say, I need to step up. And so the way God has designed Jen has led me to have to be a leader and to, be, to address certain things along the way and to have to step up and into certain things. And then God has been working on Jen to be able to um, use her leadership and use it in a God-honoring way. And so I found for Jen and I that when we, when, when we, when we run into some of um, the tense conversations, instead of making comments that um, build a wall, we want to make comments that build a bridge. So you, you feel that way? Tell me a little bit more. I want to understand more of what you're coming from. You feel that way? Tell me a little bit more. And then together we start finding solutions, and that's a beautiful way of being honoring to each other, right? So instead of making statements or comments that just build a wall between you, Try to use comments that build a bridge so that you guys can gain an understanding. I love the way Jesus does it, is that Jesus doesn't just take point, but he's a hero maker. So when it comes to feeding the 5,000, he gives to the disciples and then they pass it out, right? They pass out the food and the miracle happens through them. And then he says, even greater things are you going to do, right? Right? And then I love the example of Christ, how he emptied himself, and then God highly exalted himself, him and gave him the name that is above every name. And so you see within them that they honor each other's role, and it becomes this beautiful, beautiful picture of um, what the church is to look like and what marriages should look like, um, to be able to honor each other and make heroes of each other. All right? So that's, that's a little bit of a, a cultural thing they're trying to solve. And great for us to reflect on on how to honor each other. And then for the second half, Paul goes into a situation where they're actually not honoring each other in the way that they're taking communion. So let's look at that in verse 17. You guys ready for this? Verse 17. In the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for worse. So in this passage, he's saying, I'm I'm not able to commend you here because... When you meet t- together, it's, it's actually not very honoring the way you're, you're doing your meals and taking communion. In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So in other words, when you gather as a church, it's, it's actually not, not going so great. There's divisions among you. But then he says, there have to be factions. There have to be factions among you so that there's a genuineness that can come from it. Now, some of you have been in a variety of church situations or even in your families where you've, you've gone through um, divisions and factions, right? Some of you are, have come from situations where you felt dishonored. I'm convinced there are people in the room right now who have felt dishonored in some way either through a church experience or through a family experience. And you've sort of tucked that away and it's, it, it's hurt, it's painful. And you felt that.
I think it's beautiful that the scripture says in here, there have to be divisions. There, there, there have to be these kind of tensions among you. Because what it does is it's a process of you and I becoming more genuine. <laughs> I hate that. I, I want a happy life with no problems. Thank you very much. And here we go, right? These tensions. It's kind of like shining this beautiful white light into the prism of a fallen world. It's a broken world, right? And we shine the light into that, and all of a sudden the light splits open, right? And reveals different wavelengths. We're supposed to be one. Well, we're not. I see it differently than you see it. And there are all these different wavelengths there, right? But what it does is it reveals where some of the character things are. It reveals... Um, where some of our idolatry is. It reveals certain things along the way. And so um, it actually becomes a beautiful thing that the way God has designed it helps us to see our need for Jesus, right? <laughs> With any faction or division, you can always just hit pause and say, Jesus, we need you, <laughs> right? Jesus, we need you. Like this, this is just revealing some of the things that go on within us. And we can say, Jesus, we need you. Um, in this passage in verse 20, when you come together, you're not really celebrating the Lord's Supper. And then he goes into like, when you guys come together, to, everybody brings some food. It's called the love feast, agape. We're all eating, um, supposed to be eating together. But um, you're breaking into cliques. There's a lot of selfishness that's happening. Um, the wealthy are coming in. They're bringing all these like really tasty delicacies. And your five-year-old kid is running by just grabbing handfuls of caviar and eating them and just having a good time. And the poor people over here, this is probably the only meal they're going to have this week. They're sitting over here. You're not sharing with them. Some of you are master brewers. You're over here. You've been brewing all week, and you're like, oh, you got to taste this. you got to try this. And then over here, they're making wine and different fermented drinks. you got to try this. And they're, having, and they're just drinking way too much. And so some of them are intoxicated, and now they're supposed to celebrate communion together. And it's just like, this, this doesn't look like what it, what it means to honor each other. So it's just really unpacking a little bit of what's under the surface in all of us, that it's hard to really honor each other. The Bible says in the last days, people will be lovers of self. And I can, just, I can just confirm for you that um, it's, it's a struggle to, um, in these last days, to properly represent Christ. Um, being a pastor nowadays is, is incredibly challenging because not only am I just a regular dude, I don't have all my stuff together. Sometimes I find out that I'm selfish after the fact. Um, I don't think I properly represent Jesus. Um, the church is supposed to be this beautiful representation of a holy God. And God has chosen the weak and the foolish and the base things of this world. Since 2001, from 2001 to 24, trust in the church has gone from 60% to 32%, according to Barna research. Trust in authority, in any authority, in politics, and anything has gone way down in our country. Selfishness has gone way up. Um, anarchy could be just down the road here. Uh, people have no regard for authority. Forget it. Who cares if God built a structure and all these reasons and excuses not to honor authority? And it's extremely challenging. So here you just pull back the veil a little bit in Corinth, and that was happening 2,000 years ago. What's the solution? The, the, the love feast, the meal, is turned into communion and into a spiritual experience. And th here's the solution is to look to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Verse 23, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Think of the image of Christ on the cross saying, this is, this is my body broken for you. This is the redemption of what Adam did in the garden. This is Jesus stepping up and paying the price. Can, can you see, can you look to Jesus on the cross? Can you, can you see his blood being shed for you and willing to pay the highest price? Can you see a leader here in Jesus, who is willing to provide, who is willing to stay, to look at Jesus, to look at him. The Bible says, look at his death and do this in remembrance. And I just believe that Jesus is in the room and he's saying, as you walk up the slippery slope with this large weight on your back, Jesus is saying to you today to lay it down. He's saying, at your request, I'm going to remove the heavy load from you and I'm going to bury it at the foot of the cross. And when I unburden you, you are undeniably free. Stand up straight and tall in my presence so that no one can place more burdens on your back. Look into my face and feel the warmth of my love for you. Do you see Jesus bearing the weight of your sin on the cross? To look at him. And then the Bible says in verse 26 to look at his coming, right? Until he comes, to proclaim his death until he comes. Look at how he rose from the dead and he said, I'm coming soon, I'm, re I'm returning, I'm coming soon. And let hope fill you because of who he is and what he has done on the cross. So the solution, CFC, in this is that the world might judge God's design for things, but when we look to Jesus, it, it all comes into focus. And we emulate um, what he did for us on the cross. Verse um, 27, we look to Jesus and then we look to ourselves and have a time where we're, we're able to examine ourselves. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And so what, he, what, what um, the instruction that is given is before we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, the Bible tells us to take time to examine ourselves, right? And to just be able to do it in a, in a worthy manner. Um, some of us are afraid of self-knowledge, right? That is challenging. I know for me, um, sometimes I don't want to reflect too far and say, um, say the prayer, God, have you ever said this prayer? God, help me to know me. <laughs> it's like, I can see all of you with 20-20 vision and what's wrong, right? But he's like, God, help me to know me. Help, help me to know me. And um, when you're willing to do some self-examination and, and press into that, say, God, would you reveal to me um, what are some of the character flaws? Would you reveal to me? I believe you'll have a greater sense of God's presence with you and you'll start seeing transformation in your life when you're willing to examine yourself. And then the result in verse 33, when you come together, now you're starting to wait on each other. Now you're starting to honor each other. Now you're starting to love each other. And I can see it. I can see it. Um, there's transformation that is happening here because you've, you've looked to Jesus as his example. You've done some self-examination. And then you start to honor each other in a beautiful way. Um, let's pray together. Lord, we just want to thank you this morning for your word. And I just want to pray for those this morning who have experienced being dishonored in some way. That if we're honest, there, there have been divisions and factions. There has been hurt and dishonor. And some of us bring that into the room today. And if that's you this morning, just name it. How, how have you been hurt? How have you been dishonored?
And then just to pray and ask God for healing. By his stripes we are healed. Say, Jesus, we bring our hurt to you. We ask that you bring healing. And Jesus, we see you on the cross. We see that you were dishonored. You were hurt. You were falsely accused. You were beaten. You were a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Help us to walk the Jesus walk. We surrender our vision for a perfect life. We surrender our dream for the perfect life, for the pain-free life. And we, we want to walk as Jesus walked. So Jesus, help us to find strength in your example and to honor others well. Even when we are mistreated or misjudged or hurt. Give us the strength, God, to honor each other well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him Jesus Son He's 
It's a gift that's freely given. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. Lift your voice. It's never been about.
sit in this moment because that's the thing. This life change, this heart change, it's not a thing that we can manufacture. It's a redeeming only the Lord can do. And it comes from a posture of worshiping him, of beholding him and understanding fully his place and our place before him. And as we yield, as we submit, then he does a work in us to to make us reflect him more, to make us more like him. As we understand the depth of his love for us, then we love him in return and we love his people in return. So, Lord, it begins and it ends at your feet. Every moment we yield. For from you and through you and to you are all things. And I pray that when you look at us, Lord, you see a church that so desires to love you well, to honor you well, to serve you well, and to serve your people well. for your glory, for your namesake. Worthy are you. Amen. Church, we're going to pray from Romans 15 over one another today as we go. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you need some prayer today, would you please let us pray with you? We love to pray with you. We're in the upstairs cafe after service. Otherwise, thank you for worshiping with us today. You're dismissed.